So I want to ask you a question that may not seem to have anything to do with anything right now, but the question is, what would those who are closest to you right now, what would they say about you? Would they say that your words and your actions, your behaviors, your attitudes, everything about you, would they say that you are ministering grace, that you are ministering love, that you're ministering self-sacrifice, that you are ministering forgiveness to those who are around you. Is that what people would say about you if I could come somehow into your space right now and ask those who are right near you? Good question to start with. Our scripture passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, obviously following on uh, from our daily devotional time from uh, the scripture passage yesterday that um, Ron Thomas led us through and talked about sufficiency, which was uh, a fantastic devotional. In this passage of scripture, and I'm going to read it in just a moment, in this passage of scripture, these verses 7 to 11, the Apostle Paul, continuing in his ongoing letter to the Corinthian church, builds a contrast between what we'll call the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Uh, and we'll see that contrast, and that's really what this, the, the heart of this passage is all about. So let me take a moment and read that verse of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Verse 9, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Again, Paul paints this contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What I'd like to do is simply explain a little bit about this without going into too much crazy detail and then ask three questions and work out some of the answers to those questions. And that's where I'm going to ask your help in your comments. This can't be extremely interactive, but this can be something where you can respond with your comments. So be prepared to do that if you will. Um, otherwise, you're just going to hear my thoughts on it, which are um, limited at the best. So Paul, in this passage of Scripture, again, carrying on in context with his discussion that he is describing himself as a minister of the New Covenant, uh, from verse 5, 6, and, and downward, he paints three main contrasts between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I just want to explain some of those here. The first contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant is a ministry of condemnation. These don't necessarily go in the order in the text. They're a little bit more just a logical order as I was studying this. The Old Covenant is a ministry of condemnation, while the New Covenant is a ministry of righteousness. Now, what is meant by the fact that the Old Covenant is a ministry of condemnation. First, let me say this. Paul is not intending to say that the Old Covenant is evil or it's bad or it's uh, intended for harm or something like that. There are many other scripture passages in the Bible that talk about the role of the Old Covenant. And, and when we're talking about the Old Covenant here, we're talking about God's revelation of his law and his holiness. 
that we see in, in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant is the ministry of condemnation. Well, how does it bring condemnation? Quickly, to go over how this, this works, God, in the Old Covenant, revealed his perfect law to his people. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to reveal who he is, and he is perfect, and he is absolutely holy. So he revealed to them his perfectness and his perfect law, his highest standards. The reason this Old Covenant brings condemnation is that because of sin in our lives, no one can attain to the perfection of God's law. No one can keep it perfectly. Therefore, the result of God's perfect good law, Old Covenant, being given to us is condemnation in our hearts, guilt before the Lord, because we are not able to keep the law. In contrast, the ministry, the, the new covenant is a ministry of righteousness. It is Christ's, through Christ's, perfect sacrifice and perfect life of obedience that it is his perfect obedience, his sacrifice, that gives to us his righteousness. He stands in our place. That new covenant becomes a ministry then of righteousness to us instead of condemnation. The second big contrast between the Old, Test, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant is a ministry of death and the New Covenant is a ministry of the Spirit. Contrast interesting between the ministry of death and the ministry of the Spirit. If we look just up into the passage that Ron had shared with us yesterday in verse 6, uh, it, it tells us that the ministry, the Old Covenant, or, or the, the covenant of the letter written out, it says is the letter, excuse me, the letter kills, it says in verse 6. The letter kills. It brings death. Why so? Because the Bible is very clear in many, many places that the wages of sin is death. The wages of breaking God's law, the just deserts, if you will, for breaking God's law is death. We cannot exist in the presence of a holy God as sinful people. He cannot abide by that. It is therefore a ministry of death, resulting in death. But in contrast, the new covenant is a ministry of the Spirit. And Paul in verse 6 again says that, this new covenant gives life. It is the Spirit who gives us the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and applies that and fills ourselves with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we experience then true life through the new covenant of which Christ brings to us. Now the final contrast between the old and the new is that the Old Covenant is, is one of a temporary type of glory, whereas the New Covenant is one of a permanent, eternal, lasting glory. We're going to talk about the word glory in just a moment, but even if Paul uses this, uh, this expression it's kind of awkward in English as he talks about the Old Covenant. He says it was, was being brought to an end. Um, believe it or not, that's all one word in Greek. Uh, but we have to string it out in English to get the explanation of that. The, the glory which the Old Covenant had was a true glory. But it was a temporary glory. It was a glory that was being brought to an end because it was going to be supplanted, it was going to be replaced by something much more glorious. So the new covenant then, in contrast, maintains a permanent glory that nothing can surpass or succeed uh, beyond it. There was glory in the old covenant. It was good and right and perfect and holy. But the glory of the new covenant 
so outshines the glory of the old covenant. It's like the blazing brightness of, of the sun compared to the much softer brightness of the moon. The far greater brightness of the sun far outshines the glory of the moon. And so it is with the new covenant versus the old covenant. Let me just mention this idea of glory because Paul mentions this so often right in these few verses. When we talk about glory uh, here, um, it's a big concept. We could be here for several more hours. But I, when we talk about glory, we're primarily talking about the fact that, that well, glory is really the visible manifestation of the presence of God. It's the visible evidence that God is here. Uh, that's about the best way that I can try to explain it. It's what you perceive as you are touched with the very presence of God himself. And often, as we see in scripture, it is a physical manifestation, often of light, or it can be many other things, thunder, lightning, um, all kinds of things. The experience or the manifestation of glory and how you experience that depends on where you're coming from. It might be a very terrifying experience if you are in the wrong relationship with the Lord. It might be a fearful and dreadful uh, experience that knocks you down to your knees in fear and fright. And as the Bible says, the people will call out uh, for the stones to fall on them when the presence of God uh, appears. Or it might be the most wonderful experience that you can have, a filling of peace and joy um, or even a physical manifestation. There's, there's so much to talk about that, but that's essentially what the glory of, of God is all about. The, the glory seen here in the Old Covenant was, was a true glory. But as God has revealed himself in the New Covenant, this new glory so far exceeds the old glory that uh, it's almost like the old one evaporates in front of it. So that's really interesting, but what does that all have to do with you and me and where we're at right now and what are we doing and how can we live this out? Um, so that's where these three questions come in as we try to round out this. First question I'd like to ask on this is real simple. Good questions to ask anytime you're studying a passage of scripture or reading a passage of scripture, whether it's in a group or all by yourself. First of all, what does this passage tell us about God? What does it tell us about God or about the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, if we think about these verses, 7 to 11, uh, it's all about this glory of the Old Covenant, New Covenant, all of that. I think if we, if we took time, and, and here's where I invite you, as I work through these questions, I invite you to make comments uh, and, and help me answer this question. What does this passage tell us about God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Since I've had a little more time to think about it than you have, I'm just going to offer one uh, suggestion here, but I think there are many, many things that this passage could potentially tell us about God. First of all, and really mainly what I'd like to share is that I see in this that he has revealed to us, if you will, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, if we start with the old covenant, we're talking about the bad and the ugly first, and not that God is bad and ugly, but the ugliness of sin. And it's the result of sin being disobedience to God's perfect holiness. In God's love for us, he loves us enough to reveal to us and to let us know what his high standards truly are. Recognizing, of course, all along that because of our sinfulness, we cannot attain to that. But he has revealed this to us. His, in, in, his, in the Old Covenant, he's revealed his holiness through the law. And in the New Covenant, he's revealed to us his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ that 
over that outshines the old covenant because the grace extends to all of us who could not meet the requirements of the old covenant. So I'm not seeing yet any responses to the question, what does this tell us about God or about Jesus? But you think about that and feel free to comment uh, in the next few minutes as we go along. Uh, I think that's just one thing this tells us. I got one, Matt Broadway says, God is glorious. Amen. Meredith says, we learn that God sees us as valuable. Valuable enough to make any kind of covenant in the first place. It's true. Uh, uh, reflecting on, you know, the psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, what are we? How in the world? Well, we are God's creatures, uh, and he made us. So he must know what he's doing, and he values us that much. Good responses. Thank you. And keep them coming if you have thoughts on this. Just trying to stimulate your thinking about this. The second question I'd like to ask is, what does this passage tell us about us? What does this passage tell, tell us about you, about me, and who we are? Again, I invite your comments on this. Uh, what can we learn about ourselves from looking at this passage? Well, you might say, well, there's nothing to learn about us from this. It's just about covenants. Um, well, if we look at the whole context of this letter in 2 Corinthians, we can see that, as, as Ron and others and Pastor Matt have pointed out, that Paul is, is bringing up the argument to the Corinthians that he is himself a minister of this new covenant. Uh, and he's describing now in this passage what that new covenant is and how it far outshines the old covenant. And Paul understands himself literally as a minister of this new covenant and, and a herald of that new covenant, very literally announcing to the world that there is a new covenant of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul and the other apostles had the privilege of heralding that for the very first time to a world that had never heard it before. Now, by extension, as we've been saying over the last several days, we are like Paul in the sense that we also are to be ministers of this new covenant. Now, we are not like Paul in the sense that we are apostles heralding this news for the very first time into the world. I mean, what a privilege they had. It's not really new news for many people. Um, but it is our job to be ministers of that new covenant. We are ministers of the new covenant. You are a minister of the new covenant. I hope that you, at least through the study of 2 Corinthians, are beginning to see yourself that way. God has swept us up in Christ into something incredible. And that is this, this ministry that he has of a new covenant. It, it gives me, and I, I hope it gives you, a sense of grand purpose that's much larger than myself, much larger than my own little world or my own needs and things. It's to live for being a representative or an ambassador is maybe even a better word. Living for being an ambassador of God's new covenant in Christ. You might think, man, you know, that's like, that's really cool for missionary people to do that. No, that's for all of us to do no matter and to live out no matter what contexts we are in, whether it may seem the most mundane, everyday context, what a, what a way of flooding your context right now with a grand purpose. You are a minister of this new covenant of grace, of righteousness, of life, of the Spirit to those around you. The final question 
I'd like to pose here is probably the most difficult. And again, I want to invite your comments. This, this is, it takes a while to get us thinking about it, but it's really worth thinking deeply about this final question as well. And that is, how can you specifically obey this passage? How can you live it out? How can you live out in very specific ways, actions, today, tomorrow, next few hours, how can you live out what it means to be an ambassador of the new glorious covenant? How can you live that out to those who are around you? Our contexts are maybe, for most of us, simplified just a little bit, meaning we're, a lot of us are, for the most part, confined at home now. We have, we're not scattered. Our days are not broken up too much into visiting different people and interacting in different contexts. Things have been simplified a little bit. So it might be a little bit easier to think, how can I specifically be an ambassador for the covenant of Christ in, in my context right now? among the people that are closest to me. What does that look like for me today? And I don't want you to just answer that question. I want you to answer it, but I also want you to do it, obey it. If you identify, well, okay, that means for me that I, I need to show more grace to my eight-year-old son as he interrupts me while I'm trying to do my work in meeting with people and sending emails and all that at home uh, and, and give him a sense of, of love and acceptance that I might otherwise uh, uh, not give him, then I, maybe I've identified something. I need to do it then. So don't stop with identifying. Uh, I see some comments here. This is good. Think specific. What is it very specifically that you can do in the next day or so that leads you or that, that is acting as a representative of this new covenant? How can you treat others differently? How can your actions be so that your life is, that, that people will say about you, he or she is truly a minister of that new covenant it just it it comes out in all of what you say and what you do um, I'd like to see comments about ideas and what that might look like you might not be comfortable sharing in this particular format a rather public way uh, what specific actions you need to take and that's fine least think about it or make some generalized comments, but don't stop with general things in your personal life. Really think about how you're going to obey this, because that's what discipleship is all about. It is actually obeying what Jesus tells us to do. If not, we stop short of being the disciples that Jesus wants us to be. May the Lord bless you and grant you true obedience in, as you follow him. Thank you. Bye-bye.